Good morning, everyone. Alfred Cromwell here from City Tutoring. I have a class coming up this morning, so I'm not going to be able to make a very, very long video. Uh, but I will. Uh, this video is going to be about logical fallacies that I need you young people to stop making, to stop uh, falling into these traps, these illogical traps. And I have an announcement because later today in the afternoon, I will also be posting 10 propositions from my book, my upcoming book, uh, Mathematical Analysis. And I hope to give you a, that it's mainly because I wanted to give you a taste of what it's going to look like, what the style is, in case you might be interested in actually having a proper mathematical analysis book. So that's coming up later today. I just have to um, see which uh, I'll probably start with uh, chapter one, which is the foundation of everything, the 10 propositions and their proofs. And uh, it's, you know, writing books is not easy. Uh, it takes a lot of time and it's something that I've been working on, you know, and at first I, I write them out by hand and I have to type them um, on a typewriter just because I'm used to that system. And then now, now I'm finally getting used to a little bit. Uh, thankfully, one of the gentlemen who watches this channel, uh, thank you. If you're watching this video, thank you so much for the raspberry pie that you sent me as a gift. I am eternally grateful to you. I don't deserve it. Uh, but I appreciate very much your generosity and I intend to make very good use of it in the way that you indicated it can be used. Um, it has a, uh, it's uh, d Linux uh, is downloaded in there. So I'm, I'm moving more into the direction of Linux. I am not interested in Microsoft Windows at all. But anyway, uh, that's another story. Uh, this video is going to be about some logical fallacies that you need to stop because I hear this all the time from people and it, uh, it's something that's been irritating me for a while. And I figured since you're most, many of you are math majors, you need to know this. And if you, some of you know it, but if you don't, you need to commit this to memory. All right. Now to give you some perspective on this, uh, some of you have not had exposure to this. You really, the, the fallacies do not originate from a single book, from a single modern book. Anyway, there are modern logic books that will explain all of them. And one of the ones that I recommend, by the way, it's a really good one, is Introduction to Logic by Irving Copi, or Copi, C-O-P-I. Um, but it, it really comes from a long tradition of classical logic and rhetoric. It goes all the way back to Aristotle. And uh, Aristotle, back in 350 BC, uh, he wrote the sophistical refutations and it's really one of the earliest and most influential texts where uh, many fallacies were formally categorized and aristotle uh, i believe if i recall correctly listed 13 fallacies uh, and he divided them into uh, verbal fallacies linguistic and material like begging the question false cause etc he didn't use obviously he was writing in ancient greek but later on uh, in the medieval period, you have uh, Latin names, as you see on the screen, began to be used. And if you have not taken Latin ever, I strongly recommend you young people, if you are an undergrad especially, or even in high school, I, uh, I took Latin uh, both in high school and in college. I, I studied under the, the textbook that we used was Wheelock's Latin. And I have very fond memories of Latin. Uh, and I also took French. So uh, I like learning uh, the structure of languages as well. So we begin then with the first, uh, the, the most known one. Most people know the first one, right? Which is just um, ad hominem, right? We call that ad hominem. And these days, it's one of the most common tactics of the smug type who cannot argue his way out of a paper bag. You attack the man instead of the message. You sometimes see an example of that around here, right? You've all seen comments sometimes from some the weirdos, right? That's an ad hominem, by the way, but it's pretty appropriate in this case. Um, you know, they'll say something like, shut up, you Bible thumping. And, you know, the adjectives get worse from there. The translation really is, I have no argument, so I'll insult you instead. We saw that during the math sorcerer video. 
Some of his supporters said, oh, you're so mean and evil. Of course, they never addressed the issue at hand, which was that the sorcerer uh, is using AI and is scamming his own readers, his own audience. And it, that had nothing to do with me personally. But in their desperation, they had to come up with some insults. Right? When you don't have an argument, you have insults. And there's nothing new there, so moving on. The second one we see here is the secundum quid. And really, it's the fallacy of uh, the hasty generalization. You know, from a single grain of sand, they think they're in a desert. It's like seeing one empty church to claim the Christian lifestyle and religion is dying. Or one that I hear often, um, sorry, sir, but in my math class, we still learn about sets. Therefore, you're wrong about the poor state of math education in this country. No, Jeremy. Color coding a Venn diagram with scented markers in eighth grade common core doesn't mean we're producing the next Euler. I also included a quote here from the atheist that you can see atheist uh, Christopher Hitchens. Uh, God is not great. He wrote a book by that title. And it turns out Hitchens himself wasn't as great as he thought. God had the last word after all with him. But notice what it says. Notice what uh, it, it's being said by Hitchens in the book. He says, Iraq boasts quite a long history of intermarriage and intercommunal cooperation. But a few years of this hateful dialectic soon succeeded in creating an atmosphere of misery, distrust, hostility, and sect-based politics. Once again, religion has poisoned everything. Page 27. You can find it here, by the way, the, the, the source. I put a link here. Um, you can, if you look that up, you can find, and, and more examples uh, in there as well. The other uh, issue here is number three, the ad vericundiam. That is the appeal to authority. And it's the preferred device of midwit, government bureaucrats and those adjacent to them. And rather than prove a point, they invoke some credentialed uh, name like it's a magic spell. Rather than proving a point, they shout names like incantations. Dr. So-and-so from Harvard says that students learn math when it's entertaining and with a lot of pictures, as though parroting some tenured sociologist somehow equals the truth. No. An appeal to authority is not an argument, especially when the authority has a PhD in what? Now, I don't know about you, but given the amount of crazy PhD degrees out there, excuse me for not taking seriously someone who has a PhD in, say, I don't know, post-colonial ethnic studies or some other such nonsense. You then have the ad ignorantium, the appeal to ignorance, if you can't prove it's false. It must be true. By that logic, unicorns exist, right? The IRS is benevolent. And no person, no liberal that I know of, ever changed majors six times before settling on some strange uh, other major. Uh, case in point, you have the modern university's defense of administrative bloat. And you hear things all the time like, oh, there's no evidence these DEI provosts are, are not improving student outcomes. Right. And there's no proof unicorns aren't auditing the budget either. You then have ad populum. That's, of course, the appeal to the masses. We hear that all the time, especially in our societies that have become... Uh, the United States was founded as a republic, as a constitutional republic, not a democracy, and certainly not a mass democracy, like we uh, are often confused these days. Um, of course, it is a democratic republic, and there is something to be said about democracy in the proper use of the word, but not. But it was certainly not mass democracy as we see today. And just because the crowd cheers doesn't make the play any good. Modern academia in its pursuit of uh, impact factor and citation metrics has abandoned substance for style and increasingly not even style. And today, uh, many people, uh, many students are judged not by rigor, 
a paper today, an opinion today is judged not by the logical rigor behind it, but by how many people click like on X or some other such uh, social media. The science of the mob is not science. We have that now in America, by the way. We have trial by TV and social media where even members of the jury are threatened. And we even had one president intervene in recent history as had never been done in history before in a judicial case during the uh, you saw that during the George Floyd trial. For example, former uh, President Biden personally called his family. He tried to meddle and intimidate the jurors in many indirect ways. No American president had ever done that before. We've had other high profile trials where, again, it's a uh, trial by media. Prophetically, interestingly enough, there's an old interview. You can look it up on YouTube if you I, I forgot this, the search words, but uh, it was uh, former British Prime Minister Margaret Thatcher warned this could one day happen in Western countries. She said you would have trial by media, trial by media. If you have trial by media, you would lose all pretense of the rule of law. You would lose all uh, the traditional rights that were associated with uh, the at least the English system that we had, the common law, America and uh, Great Britain. We see that today. You say the wrong thing, people show up at your house, for example, the mobs, and they are protected in many cases by the uh, by the ruling parties. We saw that many times. Uh, we saw it in 2020 and we saw it uh, a little bit after that. Um, and we, we're still seeing it to some degree, although people have are starting to wake up. Uh, we then have ad baculum, which is the appeal to force or to war. Uh, terrorists do that with their unannounced bombs and murders. And so-called college activists do it with cancel culture. And the idea is the same. You agree with us or else. Or else what, my love? This is not persuasion. It's intimidation dressed in ideological drag. And yet many modern, so-called modern thinkers cheer this kind of coercion. Provided it silences, of course, the right, quote unquote, people. You can spot this fallacy every time a speaker says something like, oh, uh, I've had this being said to me. You don't agree with DEI. You should be reported. We would report you for creating an unsafe, hostile work environment. The, the, the real translation is we cannot counter your argument, so we'll punish you for making it. You see this a lot more in Europe. And in Latin America, where they do not have the First Amendment of our precious constitution that our ancestors shed blood for us to have those fundamental Bill of Rights. Centuries later, Europe is still a place where dissent is severely punished, just like they did to our settler Christian ancestors. Europe is peppered with hate speech laws, for example, that can place you under arrest if you come up with an argument their, their government doesn't like. God forbid we ever become Europeanized in that way in America. Although sadly, we see that more and more in our young people, uh, they clamor for safe spaces rather than freedom. That's for another topic, though. But I am not optimistic with the newer generations when it comes to our freedoms. I believe uh, many of the young people today uh, are losing that idea of the, the spirit of independence, the, the rugged individualism that characterized our great country once. They are becoming more collectivist, uh, etc. Then you have circular reasoning, right? Otherwise known as begging the question. And it's classic pseudo logic. And it goes something like this. We, whoever we is, are smarter than them, those backwards people, which means we understand more. And because we understand more, we make fewer mistakes which proves we are smarter than them. And it's really the kind of airtight, I don't even know what to call it, but you'd expect from a, you hear this sort of thing from uh, perhaps a sophomore in critical theory, in a critical theory course. But in math, proving that P implies Q implies R implies P doesn't mean anything is true. Only that the propositions are logically equivalent. But in other majors, it's apparently enough to earn a thesis price, or so they think. You then have equivocation, right? That is when you start shifting definitions midstream. And we see this all the time as well. For example, people morph um, 
when you hear morphing terms like nation, people, identity, or race, depending on which emotional nerve the, the politician wants to prod, they can't even get that right. Right? They are all separate categories of things. Nation is not the same as people necessarily. Identity is not the same as race necessarily. And in the case of the U.S., as we see, we do not have. Um, we do. Some countries have uh, nationality by origin. Right. In other words, you have to have blood ties in the country. Uh, the United States only has uh, what they call in Latin "use solis," which means that uh, if someone is born in the United States, they are automatically given. Uh, citizenship, but it doesn't mean necessarily uh, citizenship in America doesn't necessarily imply blood ties to America. Uh, and so you have what you have today. We have a lot of fraud. We have people coming from other countries who just want to have babies here because they want because they know uh, it's a ticket to their passport. And it's it's ridiculous that we allow these sorts of things. Um, another example that we hear a lot of these days is a right is something we all have. Education is a right, people say. Therefore, everyone has the right to a college degree. And therefore, failing our students is akin to a human rights violation. No, it's an admissions policy, dear, not the Geneva Convention. And no, there is no such right to, an, to a college education in the Constitution. This is what you get when you swap Euclid for lived experience and redefine failure as oppression. You then have post hoc ergo propter hoc. In other words, after this, therefore, because of this. And hopefully you can see it on the screen there. And an example of that would be something like, well, after we get, after we got uh, these new diversity hires, student complaints went down. Amazing. We're so nice now. Of course, the complaints went down. Everyone's too afraid to speak. This is the foundation of every government policy based on vibes, like claiming we raised taxes and the economy did not collapse. So clearly, taxes cause prosperity. It's not logic, by the way. It's critical theory in drag, pretending to be logic. But it's anything but. You then have the, the last point I want to make which is confusing the consequent with the antecedent. In other words, just because A implies B doesn't mean B always implies A. Meningitis causes fever, yes, but having a fever doesn't mean you have meningitis. But try explaining this to someone whose entire worldview is oppression causes inequality. Therefore, every inequality is caused by oppression. And they've confused symptoms with causes, feelings with facts, and Instagram likes with the validation that only the truth can give. You know, I've often thought that math majors should really run the world, or at least our universities, rather than the angsty, awkward introverts who suffer panic attacks to find themselves by their invented pronouns rather than their thinking, and whose only modus operandi is grievance. That's all, folks. Uh, if you like this video, please continue to subscribe and please continue to help this channel grow. Let's make it to 40,000 by next week. Thank you all.